Uh, hey boys and girls, hi, welcome to uh, another edition of Monroe Live, and we are fortunate to have Joe Justice with us, and, uh, and Corey, I mean, does it get any better? The gang's all here. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is maybe, um, first off, some of you may not know who Joe is, so I'm going to ask him to give, him, give himself a, a quick introduction, and um, you've probably heard lots about Corey, so we'll skip him and me. So, Joe, can, Joe, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and who you kind of like work with? I think that's really important. Thanks so much, Sandy and Corey. I'm well known for agile hardware uh, and agile making changes in production fast, really fast. Um, I worked with Bill Gates before uh, and then the leadership team at Amazon. And I, I consulted to Tesla as early as 2010. And I set up some of the first agile trainings in Tesla uh, and then ultimately became a Tesla employee in 2020. I founded and operated the agile program at Tesla from Fremont, California. At that time, that was the headquarters um, during the pandemic, too. And that was I, I learned a lot. Um, so <laughs> right, in, in you didn't get arrested. Wasn't wasn't the uh, wasn't the governor or whatever kind of unhappy about that sort of stuff? Hmm. So. Uh, Toyota, Ford, and GM all had agreed on a restart date that was the same date. And then only the California governor said, oh, but not you, Tesla. And at Tesla, we're like, come on, level playing field. This is this is global. Yeah. If everyone gets to restart manufacturing numbers, and this is when Model Y is still young and people were really watching production numbers. Like people were trying to figure out daily production numbers if they could. Drones flying regularly. Yeah. There's still drones flying regularly. Yeah. But production numbers were a big deal. And uh, not restarting on the same date is something that will clearly impact the stock price, maybe kill the company. And wow. the California governor has no appreciation of that at all. Apparently, uh, it, that was not said at all. But it was the same date for every company except Tesla. What is is California a magic different planet where germs work differently? Mm. Mm. Well, I uh, I have my own views on uh, the way the government views Tesla. I, I've I've heard that some of the high ranking people in the government can't even can't even say his name without uh, shuddering or what have you. Yeah, it's a it's a strange planet we live on right now. A strange situation in our country. Um, or I think it's still our country. I'm not <laughs> not really sure. I I got to take a check on that. But uh, but yeah, I I I, I did hear uh, a little about that. But but you also worked for uh, Jeff Bezos as well, right? Yeah yeah. I, I consult as a consultant. I wasn't a full time employee like I was at Tesla. Uh, mm. But yeah. Um, so I've had a chance to like. Monroe Associates, I, I've had a chance to consult on Agile or, or be an employee. I've, I've mm. changed employee jobs about every two and a half years. So I, by now that means I got to do a few things. But I've gotten to um, work with uh, a lot of defense like Monroe Industry does um, mm. and the automotive supply chain. Toyota, um, I trained the next CEO of Toyota, uh, Daisuke Toyota in Agile. The idea is for Toyota to try to operate in an agile way once Daisuke becomes CEO. Uh, Akio supports this, but uh, it's left up to Daisuke to make that mm -hmm. change. Uh, mm -hmm. Then Denso, et, et cetera. And then, yeah, Defense, like Monroe and Associates does. So Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, um, Boeing, Boeing Military, um, mm -hmm. Raytheon, et cetera. It's similar, similar to what Monroe Associates does. What I love is how transparency maybe not the right word but how much all of us uh, with an internet connection can learn from Monroe Associates about production optimization mm -hmm. and um, the part of lean that matters um, well okay the, the whole house of lean is, is a pretty important beautiful thing but the actually reducing part cost uh, in terms of time in terms of material in terms of complexity in, in terms mm -hmm. of accessibility. Um, Monroe Associates makes more of that accessible to more people than before the internet age ever had. Uh, and, and I love that. And what I've been able to do is similar, reducing the cost to change parts. So if people want to introduce a new octo valve, 
a, a new innovation that it can be done today in production as opposed to waiting for the next minor model change or major model change two and a half years or five or seven years later. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of like uh, what I really uh, admire about you. you um, you've done stuff that mm, I just have never been successful at. So we always can come up uh, with, the, with the process. We have lean design as our process. And, and we can always come up with the next generation of what that part uh, should look like or that sub-assembly or that system or whatever. But we could never never convince anybody to do it immediately. And that's where things change. So, I mean, in the, in the old fashioned, kind, 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 uh, uh, let me rephrase that. In the uh, older OEMs, the, uh, the resistance to change is extremely strong. As a matter of fact, I say it all the time. If you want to get ahead and you're at an older OEM, just say no. Uh, I mean, that'll get you ahead faster than anything. You can't make a mistake if you never do anything. Just say no. Can we do that? No. Mm -mm. Why not? Oh, it's bad. That's all you had to do and scares the uh, lights out of the executives and that's it. They stop. And then when they see something that was done by someone else, they can bring it up and say, well, remember when I brought that up to you and, uh, and they take credit uh, for something that, but somebody said, no, well, it was you, <laughs> you, you told us no, but they, they never remember that. Yeah, that's Chucky, man. We, we really need Chuck. He's really good. Uh, and Chuck always gets ahead by saying no. The guy that says yes, they fire him out the door. That guy's a loose cannon. Go on. Yeah. So, uh, but, but we do, we do uh, see eye to eye on almost everything. I can't think of a single thing that, that, uh, that um, I, I could point at and say, oh, that's bad. But the one thing that I really liked was the two 12-hour shifts. That, uh, when, when I saw that, that's what I did when I was at Ford. The, uh, the tradesmen loved it. I mean, because uh, I was covering, you know, the shift one, two, and three, making sure that my projects got, got finished uh, on the factory floor, whereas the other engineers may show up at noon, you know, because it's, it's the holidays, right? It's like Easter, Christmas, whatever, some kind of holiday. And that's when you install new, uh, new product, uh, sorry, new, new equipment. Um, so... I, I always got the best, uh, the best tradesmen. I always got the, uh, uh, you know, the newest parts. And if anything was meet, needed and whatnot, I didn't have it on my machine or what have you. They'd go and cannibalize it from somebody else's machine. I loved it. I loved the trades guys. They were always good to me. But then I, I, I should mention too, I, I, I am a tool maker. So I had, a, I had the inside track with most of the trades guys. But how did you make things... Who did you have to convince at, um, at Tesla to make things happen? Were you dealing like directly with Elon? Is that how you have to make it work? It has to come straight from the top or how did that Elon, happen? Elon makes sure that the culture wants constant change. And I, I think when, when people admire or vilify or react to Elon's leadership style, that's part of what they're reacting to that maybe they're not always used to. Um, so if you've worked with someone who's been in Tesla a long time, they're used to it. Um, as a new hire, the first four hours of anyone's experience in Tesla is basically getting that set in your brain again and again and again. Change is going to be constant. And because of that, your job description is really just a suggestion. You're going to need to dogpile on whatever comes next. Um, it makes... I think a much more natural company experience, but it's extremely different to how most defined work, standardized workplaces happen. There's, there is the lean concept of standardized work in the Musk companies, but it changes multiple times a day. So you're told that it's going to change yeah. multiple times a day. Uh, so yes, I think that's Elon directly, um, mostly through email, uh, company-wide email, reminding again, 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 pushing again, again, again. And I think um, if Elon isn't as present in any of Elon's companies as Elon is, I, th I think it would revert. Um, I think it would be similar to other companies. Hey, Joe, I have a question for you. So, yeah, worry. Um, well, more of a statement than a question. So Monroe, we're about a hundred person employee and a hundred person 
uh, company. And in the last, let's say, two and a half years, it's been a wild ride. And I think Sandy's done a great job of shifting our business to kind of um, change for this modern world. Um, Sandy's very present. He's in every day. He's in many of the important meetings. And, and we've hired a tremendous amount of talent in the past year and a half. I think we have 30 employees we've hired just in 2022. Is there any advice beyond what you just said about kind of that four-hour indoctrin- indoctrination? Um, any advice I could get from you on how we can push forward and, and kind of help our culture? From from a culture perspective, I've got a, a theory that's treated me really well so far, and I'm I'm willing to be wrong, <laughs> but I'm happy to share what what I, what I've what I've been what I've what's been working so far. Um, Joe's theory of change management, culture change, is um, highest priority is excitement. If people are low energy, any change is unwelcome. Period. End of sentence. If people are interested, excited, inspired, feel there's a cause, a mission, or it's fun, whatever, change is not difficult. So that's step one, how to make it exciting, uh, mm-hmm. intrinsically motivating. Uh, and when you run out of that, the change initiative can't proceed at the same pace. So there's a speed of change that's tolerable and survivable by any size group, my theory. And it, that speed that's tolerable or even interesting or wanted is throttles up and down depending on how excited people are. Um, so if you've just gone through, a, in a traditional massive company, if you've just gone through a few rounds of layoffs, the appetite for change is zero until you're at this hardcore group of employees that is going to make it or break it in the company, you know, your, your, your last reserve, your to the bone, uh, then the tolerance for change is extremely high again. They're, they're all bought in, right? Um, which Musk just did in Twitter. Um, and it I actually, I don't think any of us could know it from just looking at the news, whatever that means, but um, it actually seems to be working super well. I mean, Twitter has more simultaneous real life humans right now than ever in its history. By some core metrics, the company's rocking. Um, and, and so I think that's the result. Um, but the change management culture excitement. Okay, well, how do you get that? Um, Elon does it with mission. And he sets a thousand year goal for each company. And that's continually pushed to everyone, mostly through mass email. Uh, about one a month. It depends on global events to write on. And Elon's really good at email. Elon says that himself. I, and I agree. So people get really excited about the mission reacting to how Elon talks. In other companies, it can just be by making it really fun. Like in early Google, when they installed a sushi bar and a climbing wall, that was a big deal. People were like, I want to go to Google. And then they added like singing toilets, you know, the Japanese style bidet singing toilets. Mm. And uh, and what a post office inside, which is now actually not that abnormal for these mega companies. Uh, hairdressers. <laughs> so they're like, I want to go to work. So whatever it is, that seems to be the, the theory. Then how to make it the change you want. Okay, now we're getting more into my wheelhouse. Um, step one, try to get everybody excited, in, in, you know, as responsible as you can. Um, step two, how to make it the change you want. Once nearly 100% of headcount has the culture you want, then you don't need much. You just hire at less than 20% of total headcount at a time. So we stay on one side of the the chasm, as Jeffrey Moore says in Crossing the Chasm. And he's talking about customers, but it's true for most culture change. Apparently, I I believe it to be true for most culture changes. So if we stay with less than 20% change, you actually don't need to do much. Those people fall into the current culture, whether you like that or not. Okay, what if you want to intentionally change or improve or just catch up? you know, whatever, modify culture in any, any way, then you go through training and follow on coaching. So people stay immersed and it's just like learning a new language, like a survival course in a new language, and then keeping it up, having each morning and before you go to sleep a reminder, that's what coaches are supposed to do. And training seems to work much better if you're, if you're looking for change, if people sleep. So at least two days, you get bombarded with the new information 
and typically people don't agree with it because it's changed almost no matter what it is. Then you sleep. Now you're not so alien to the idea. You're, you're, you, you might consider whatever the idea is by now. You've had a night's sleep on it. And then immediately practice whatever the culture is. Immediately behave. And, and this is why group work is so effective for culture change. Yeah. On especially day two and then on forever. If you're in a group where people are trying to model the new culture you want, even if it's not really their natural culture yet, but they're trying. And maybe you have posters that remind people like the House of Lean or the Agile Principles that remind mm -hmm. them of the culture you're trying to make. That seems to sure be enough. Well, you know, it's it's kind of funny. You hit a, a whole bunch of different uh, points. Um, I think I showed you this once already, but this is our little card that we hand out uh, to people. And it, we call it the good design principles. And number one on the good design principles, the difference between good and bad designs is teamwork. And man, oh, you want to talk about a struggle. When you go up and say, well, I'd like to have, um, you know, I'd like to have a guy, a couple of guys from the factory floor and the product design engineers and the manufacturing engineers. And then I'd like to have some of the, uh, you know, people who are never done this stuff before, maybe a secretary or somebody from accounting or something like that. Can we bring them in? No, no. You know, that's kind of like, and then you mentioned a thousand year, thousand year plan. Okay, so I have a story. I went to uh, I went to Japan first time I went to Japan, and I was with a bunch of VPs and directors, but I wasn't a VP or a director. I was a manufacturing engineer from engine division staff, and uh, so we get into this thing, and you know how they do the Japanese thing? You get a long table like this, and the big shots are sitting in the center, and then as you go out they become less and less important until you get to me and I wasn't important at all. So uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, big, the big shots, the vice presidents were all yakking and Iji was there, Iji Toyota, he was right there. He was sitting in the center of the table and he had vice presidents and all kinds of other people that were backing him up. Not one other person made any noise. Iji did all the talking, all of it. One of the guys said, um, so, what do, you, what do you have for your one year and your, your quarterly one year and five year plans? And he sat there for a second and he said, I have a hundred year plan. And everybody just about, I definitely stopped breathing. And he said, um, he turned around to somebody and he's basically in Japanese said to go fetch it. <laughs> one, one of the VPs started laughing. And he, he turned around and he looked at him and he said, mm, what's the joke? What's so funny? And the guy said, a hundred year plan, you'll be dead. Your grandchildren will be dead. Why would you ever make a hundred year plan? He put his hand up like that and stopped the guy. And then he said something in Japanese. So my interpreter was sitting right beside me. And I said, excuse me, uh, what, what did that guy, just, what did he just say? And she said, oh, nothing. It doesn't matter. And I said, I, I'd like to know. Um, I, I don't think I can tell you. Well, why not? Well, I, I don't think you'll understand. I said, try me. Where there's arrogance, there's opportunity. That's what he said. I wrote that down. A hundred year plan. Can you imagine? How, how do you think of a hundred year plan? A thousand year plan, I, I can't even comprehend. But but a hundred year plan, I figured there should be, every company should have a hundred year plan. I don't, I just don't understand why they, I would have died to see that. I mean, how did they, everything was, this is prior to electronic everything. What, what, what kind of a book did you put it in? How did you, how did you frame it? What did you, I mean, how did you do this? So I've been told that um, EG's plan was cast asunder. <laughs> By, uh, by the newer people in the, in the company. But I, I would really have liked to have seen that 100-year plan. Uh, that would have been just brilliant, but unfortunately, um, you know, bigger heads prevailed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe, do you have a 10-year or 100-year plan for your business? Man, okay. Um. <laughs> Well, that's cruel. I'm actually, I, 
I, I'm I'm in I'm in Japan right now. Actually, mm -hmm. I mean I'm in our, our Tokyo office. Um, I, I'm part of a oh. tiny company now. I founded a tiny company, um, and we we're based out of Hawaii and Tokyo at the moment. But we're trying oh, to. Oh, that sounds tough. Well, I'm yeah, it's, it's, awful. it's awful. Can we visit uh, your place? <laughs> look, I, I think we should have an agile board meeting in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, get, yeah. Get, 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 sounds get good to me. Board. Yeah, I, I'm ready. Quick, sign me up. Yeah, um, trying to open a, a little office in Germany right now. I, I'd say one of my challenges, um, and I don't know if that's where we want to take this conversation, but just me, Joe, is what's my thousand year goal? I had one, and then I, I had a real derailing set of events. Um, I had had a wonderful time in consulting, but that's mostly going into companies and saying, what do you need? What I'm good at is, is speed of change. Would you like that? And then that's been really important, especially during the supply chain crunch, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in terms of me, the best I got right now, and I, I guess to normal people, they'd say, wow, you've really got your junk together. But for me, this is just not nearly clear enough, um, is I, I'm, I'm trying to get into orbital and space housing. Uh, so saving up for a Starship launch to try to buy out a Starship launch um, and, and basically put as, as, as a test, like imagine Airstream trailer sized orbital items to test different types of comfortable human habitat. The, the idea is to actually get into housing. I, I hope eventually long-term durable housing in space. If we're going to someday travel out among the stars, um, Alpha Centauri, I mean, interstellar, right, really someday, then I'd like to be part of iterating and testing some of the technology stack that makes that more and more likely. Um, and if that means spending a few months, few years in orbit as tests, um, developing what's actually a desirable, comfortable, lovely lifestyle out among the stars, um, I'm game. And I'm moving towards that. Now, that said, my, my goal is not nearly precise enough for my liking. So right now, I'm mostly building up technology stack skill. Uh, so Cyberlander, that you know very well, I've, I've joined yeah. Cyberlander as an advisor because some of their technology that they're working on is quite similar. If you think of a Starlink current gen size satellite, so about seven meters by three meters by half a meter tall, um, it's basically the size of an RV, but flat. Like it, it's like an Airstream trailer, but flattened, but half a meter tall. Um, the current Starlink and the Pez dispenser idea would would actually be very economical for what I want to test. Well, that means you'd want to be able to expand up, but keep very high level of strength for meteorite impact, etc. Uh, especially if you're in low Earth orbit, where it's you know more busy, uh, and you'd want high levels of insulation and thermal rotation basically you've got your hot side and your cool side so you want to be able to transfer well expansion basically armor skin high levels of insulation and then also some of the opportunity for thermal rotation moving the hot side to the cool side rapid enough that you actually need less insulation you know you're just sharing the temperature are all core pieces of tech that cyberlander already has a fairly evolved tech stack and is actively attacking. So for my uh, helping humanity, all life move out among the stars uh, eventually, you know, that's a, that's a thousand year goal. Maybe we'll do some of it soon, but I mean, if that'll last, we will continue maybe <laughs> making that better yeah. and better for at least a thousand years. Um, that's where that next step plugs in uh, as agile King of Cyberlander. Thank you so much, uh, Lance. King for that uh, that title. <laughs> oh well, there you go. Well, I I'm telling you, I, uh, I I I truly believe that we need to do that kind of stuff as well. And one of the things I don't know if you're aware of it, but NASA NASA did a tremendous amount of work um, in that area. the The number of papers was phenomenal. The data is all there, uh, and it, if you're an American citizen, you should be able to access it. I mean, if you decide that you want to go down that path, um, maybe maybe what I can do is uh, contact some. Most of the guys that I know now have retired. NASA's a much 
uh, different, smaller organization. But the data is still there and everything's electronic. You should be able to download that stuff and uh, that should help you in the designs that you want to have. I mean, why go back and test something that's already been tested? Now, I know one thing for sure. You ever seen those little pinwheel things that are in a vacuum? It looks like a, on one side it's black and the other side it's silver. They were testing something, they, they were testing something like that um, in space. And it just spun around like a top because there is some force associated with light. If you're up there, you know, around near the sun, you should be able to spin that relatively simple. The big thing was how do you slow it down? That's the, uh, uh, I mean, it'll spin faster and faster and faster as long as there's light on it. So maybe what you'd have to have is, uh, you know, maybe a shutter or something like that where uh, on the silver side so that when, you're, when you've got it at the right, uh, the right amount of rotation based on the black and the silver, you, you could just dip it down or whatever so you could get a constant speed. But all that kind of stuff, like I say, there was tons of, when we were working with NASA, I could not believe the storehouse of, um, of information, raw data uh, that, that was sitting there. I think, I think you should uh, rattle a cage or something and find out who's got it and how you can, how you can utilize it. Yeah, that'll help you out and get you faster. Yeah. And Joe, I have a question for you. So do you think Starship, is that what is enabling one of your goals? Bringing the cost down per kilogram of launch to orbit? For sure. Absolutely for sure. Um, a superpower of these companies seems to be building enabling technology that makes the financial core of the company work. I mean, if you look at um, Blue Origin, I can't buy a ride on Blue Origin to do anything directly useful. Um, if you look at Virgin Aerospace, I have to compare it to a thrill ride, like an exciting experiment. Yeah. If I look at SpaceX, the cost of access to orbit is a decimal point better than it was before SpaceX. Um, the, the fundamental hardcore engineering attack on the financial problem has has already gotten way better. So, so yes, exactly as you said, Corey. Um, I think because the cost per kilogram into low Earth orbit is much more accessible now, and the trend is for it to go another decimal point. Uh, so we'll see, but that's the trend. Um, if that were to happen, the the cost to space is very different. Um, so my big bet is if in 1980 you told someone data is going to be free and moving it around anywhere on the earth, accessing it from anywhere on the earth is going to be free. Most people would have said, you're nuts. <laughs> data is really expensive and moving and accessing data is really expensive. Well, the trend has been that that's nearly true. Right? That's, that's for many, many purposes, largely true. It's not the leading cost, moving data, accessing data, even massive amounts of data. Then the trend currently, because of a massive amount of companies now that are driving this, but led by SpaceX, you know, SpaceX is, is, is currently the, the lowest cost to orbit access company you can book a ride on. Um, because of that, the trend of access to space, putting a kilogram into space is trending towards zero. It's not there. It's still quite expensive. The trend is towards zero. Putting a kilogram of something into space is, any day of the week is trending towards zero. Now it's not there. So that's my big bet that eventually that trend and it actually looks really soon. Mm -hmm. If that comes nearly true or for some purposes true, it's just not the large cost to put something into orbit, then what does that enable? Like imagining the internet before the internet, right? If data is free and you can access it anywhere, what should I be building? What skills should I be building now? What assets and capabilities should I be building now? Well, if putting a kilogram into orbit could trend to a very low cost, so it becomes essentially free. What assets, skills, capabilities would I want to be building up? A team of people, teams, 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 teams of people, machinery, uh, 
autocomplete software algorithms? What would I want to be building up? And an early high profit margin possible bet is real estate, whatever the version of real estate is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can't beat the view of the sun rising over the earth or setting over the earth forever. Mm -hmm. You cannot beat that view. And if you can actually access that view, you know, wh whatever it is, any day of the week for an extremely low cost, it's suddenly attainable. So that could be an emerging tech stack. Now, my actual mm -hmm. wish is to be able to travel out among the stars, but a early potentially high profit in order to fund the next steps. I mean, the master plan, step one, always creates enough money for step two is the intention, right? So going into the best view on planet earth as like a, an Airbnb, you know, a million dollar a night Airbnb in the beginning, and then moving up, 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 up to eventually you've got your starship that's made to fly mm -hmm. and you travel out among the stars. I think that's a, an exciting path to try to be on to your point, Corey. Mm -hmm. And Good Sandy answer. about uh, NASA, my mom, yeah was the first lady to be trained by IBM in software development. And she, from there, became a librarian. And she helped introduce the internet to Notre Dame University in Indiana. Wow, okay. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying she architected the whole thing, but she was, the, she was involved in every step of the first internet connections at University of Notre Dame. And I remember wow. as a kid, brought in to use the internet and my mom saying this is going to be important and <laughs> you know <laughs> it was, it was, she was correct yeah she's she's a very awesome person i'm, I'm really great right there her. yeah yeah good um, on her that's great that's great when i was uh, maybe eight she said joe i want you to write a letter to nasa you like the space shuttle you like rockets you're interested in uh skylab um, why don't you write a letter to NASA? And I'm really small. And so I, I do, like in my little kid's handwriting, I write a letter to NASA, NASA, my mom guided me. And then she helped me figure out what their address was, one of the addresses that might accept mail and mail it. And that was it. A few weeks later, I got a package, not, not a letter, yeah. a package, <laughs> like a big yellow yeah. envelope, you know, big. And inside were eight and a half by 11 glossy original photos yeah. of all kinds of awesome stuff yeah. that NASA was doing. And I was shocked. Someone even opened my letter, right? That it arrived anywhere. Yeah. Clearly they read it, um, personalized That's a response great. and packed it full of stuff that shocked me with awesome. And I remember <laughs> thinking quite early, wow, our government's not very efficient with money if they'll do this to any little kid. <laughs> Uh, well, but the, the idea good. behind that, it was supposed to be to attract um, or to entice uh, young people to, you know, come to the party, as it were. And so they were doing exactly what they were told. Um, and that was probably the best money they ever invested was uh, sending you that stuff because you still remember it. Yeah. No, I'm I, I I'm I, I'm uh, I'm really excited about that because most people didn't quite uh, get the reception that you got. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I hope more people had parents or teachers or friends who encouraged them to, to send some kind of letter yeah. in. Um, I, I'm the only kid I knew that did that, right? Um, so yeah. maybe, maybe there wasn't the massive <laughs> response. But to your point, Sandy, NASA, at least at that time, and maybe still now, has made a lot of information accessible that for, yeah. for what I hope is my next path would be really helpful. Uh, yeah. So I should probably dig back in. I mean, last time I made deep. Con OK, I had some professional contact with NASA, but uh, that letter was when I was a little kid. Maybe I should write to NASA again. Maybe not in the same handwriting, but <laughs> no, I think I think it'd be a great idea. I really and truly believe that uh, that 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 information is just languishing. I mean, we worked a lot with NASA on a variety. In fact, somewhere there's a little pedestal at, uh, they, their innovation, uh, they had an innovation workshop and I, I ran it. It was like two or three days. I can't remember. Anyways, at NASA Langley, I think. But anyway, when we were there, we talked about, so I've seen a couple of unusual products. One of them, two of them, uh, basically defy gravity. 
but at the end of the day, no one, no one could figure out how to keep it, make like keep it floating, as it were. And uh, and the uh, and uh, but but all that data is still sitting there. Yeah, that's when uh, we got the title. Um, uh, Bruce Holmes, Dr. Holmes called us an innovation factory. Uh, but we didn't, uh, we, we, we didn't get any big awards and, uh, and he certainly didn't give me packages of stuff. But, but uh, I, I think that that data is still there and, and you should, I mean, you should see what you can do about extracting it. If that's your passion, you should go for that like a, like a hound on a, well, like, let me not use that. You should go for that. Like white on rice, that would be good. Yeah, I can, hey, I can Sandy, let that go. Sandy, you left out some of the best parts of that story. Of where you went to see that yeah. thing in Texas. Come on. Yeah. So uh, myself and um, and another guy, and I don't know what their name was at the time, but they used to be Honeywell, and then they split the company up, and I'm not sure which one, uh, which which group I was with. But anyways, two of us flew out to Texas, and then we drove. We were given a map, and uh, believe me, there's nothing out there. I could see where the road went. But there's no landmarks, no nothing. So we're driving back, and this is before GPS. This is before everything. We're driving back and forth. We can't find it. And then finally I said, hey, look, there's a gas station because we need gas. But even better, there's a Texas barbecue place. I like Texas. Let's go there. So we pull in, and uh, we had our Texas barbecue, and the guy filled up our gas tank. And, um, and I said, hey, we're looking for this. And we gave him the address, and uh, the woman uh, uh, that was uh, that was basically catering to us, our, our waitress or whatever, she said, "Why? Well, that's right across the street. I don't know why it, why you stopped here, but it's right across the street." And I look across the street, and here's this barn. <laughs> it's, I mean, I grew up on a farm, and I know what a shitty barn looks like, and that was a shitty barn. So um, we get back in the car, and we drive across the road. And um, we drive around, and there's nothing. We drive around to the back, and hey, there's a couple of cars there. So we drive in, park, and then walk to the, kind of like the back door. It says entrance. So we, we walked over there, knocked on the door. Door opens, and there's, uh, there's a guy there with a white suit on. He says, oh, are you from, I can't remember the name. Let's just use Honeywell for now. Are you from Honeywell? And I said, yeah, we both are. He says, oh, come on in. We've been waiting all day. Where, where were you? lost that would be the only answer i could come up so anyways he he brings us in and on the inside it looked like we were in a james bond movie all the walls are bright white and i mean it's it's it was a barn at one time but it doesn't look like a barn now so he brings us up to the loft and um and again everything's pretty spectacular in this place and there's people doing experiments and there's computers all over the place and you go holy mackerel what is this we just entered the twilight zone or we go upstairs up to the loft and he's he's got this box and it looks like a looks like a shoe box with an umbrella and it's all coated in tin foil and uh and i'm looking at it and he he says watch this and he goes Nye. he's got a little box that like a like a like a controller for a, a, an rc plane or something Nye, 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 Nye. and so anyway this thing pops up off the ground or off the deck, off the floor, and it's it's moving around as he's telling it to. And I said, uh, well, actually, they got whole trains in Germany that do that. And he, he said, oh, yeah, did you ever see this? So he opens up the loft doors, and, goes, and the thing shoots right out. We're 60, 80 feet off the ground. And it's going around, and all of a sudden, it starts shaking. He brings it back in, and it collapses on the floor. And he says, we need, we need, <laughs> we need to keep, the, we have to have more power. What, what, have you ever seen anything like this? I said, nope. I feel like a monkey right now. I, uh, no, I never saw anything like this. And he said, uh, well, <laughs> they, started, they started talking about, you know, <laughs> PhDs and master's degrees and whatnot. And I said, oh, look at the time. Let's get the hell out of here. And, and we left because there was nothing I could bring to that party. I mean, you got to know your limitations. I just saw magic and I don't know how to, but anyway, that NASA found out about that. NASA knew about it because when we did the innovation thing, we talked about it. I said, oh, yeah, that's whatever the guy's name is. 
Yeah, we know about him. Um, he seems to be a little on the secretive side. He's, sub, uh, what do you call it, uh, seclusive or something, I, a recluse, yeah. Anyways, I said, yeah, he's in Texas. Oh, not anymore. Where is he now? Uh, we don't know. So, but they, they, had, they had a lot of communication, a lot of contact. So I think getting back in touch with NASA is a fabulous idea, especially if you want to get into space and, and utilize some of those tax dollars that were spent a long time ago that probably are, like I say, languishing on some big old fashioned computer somewhere. Well, let me see if I understood. This was a flying tinfoil shoebox? That's right, with an umbrella. With an umbrella. An umbrella. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Wow. Well, well done. But it didn't go very far. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last much more than I don't think we were there. It seemed like uh, an amazing amount of time, but really and truly it was probably no more than two or three minutes. And then it was out of power and it collapsed. But if... If you can make a shoebox or whatever was in there, if you can make it up, why with the new battery tech? Actually, the one thing now would be some kind of a, some like a who knows, a hundred capacitors or something, so they could fire off one after another, and then you could lift it up. But I don't know. I don't know anything about that guy. The notes I had are gone. I I mean, this is all paper stuff. <laughs> It's all. It's I, all I bet you still have a lot of notes. I, I, I can imagine that everyone. Oh, in, yeah. 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 Catalogs. Yeah. No, there's, uh, there's six or eight. Uh, uh, four drawer filing cabinets, you know, the big wide ones uh, that are sitting in the front. Um, I don't read that fast. <laughs> so I know that they're all up there. There's logs and all kinds of other crap. But I, I uh, that's not. I uh, I don't like looking backwards. I don't have a rear view mirror. So uh, I'm I'm kind of like content. If somebody else wants to uh, get a suggestion, I'd be happy to help out. Uh, but can I, I mean, ask I, her, let me do there. Can I ask a question about Monroe Associates? I mean, when you're talking about no rear mirror and Corey's talking about the personnel ramp. So there's a piece of the Agile story of Monroe Associates that that I can even see on the outside. And that's the the famous massive became all in pivot to EVs. Uh, and, th and that's a company pivot. And it's yeah. a decision that once the looks like from the outside, once the evidence suggested that the company could benefit from this all in decision, it sounds like the decision was made and executed rapidly. Um, in a day. In one and that's day. that's what I would call agile. Mm. Um, what's the next pivot for Monroe Associates? Where would you Monroe. like that to be? Do you want to join I'd me like, in space? Yeah, well, I was going to say lower, but um, we're I'm very very interested in vertical takeoff and landing machines. So I think that uh, having a car driving on a road is about as ineffective and as inefficient as we could get. These things cost a lot of, roads cost a lot of money and uh, they wear out. They don't last much more than 20, maybe 30 years. Some guys in Europe and in Canada, 40, 45 years, something like that, but they do wear out. Um, and then you have to tear them apart again and everybody says, oh, well, it's okay because EVs are traveling back and forth on them, but in actuality, the manufacturing of roads, especially if you're using asphalt, you want to talk about pollution and air pollution and when I, that stuff is uh, nasty. So um, I can't understand why we aren't, I, you know, I, when I was a kid, I watched George Jetson. Uh, I figured I've been waiting a long time, but VTOLs are as close as I can come until we can find that guy with a shoebox. And, and actually he was as old as I am now. So I'd, he might not be with us any longer, but if if we can find out what that anti gravity machine was, that'd be great. But in the interim, while we're waiting, I see no reason why uh, we can't have vertical takeoff machines. Now, I worked with again. That's what I was working with NASA on was uh, uh, SAS, Small Aircraft Transportation Systems, and uh, we talked about that um, and um, and how we could make it happen and whatnot, and. And really and truly, all the technology is there. It's just that nobody's uh, sinking the big bucks or the right big bucks with the right people um, to make these things happen. And that's where I think there's um, a gigantic opportunity. Uh, I mean, 
uh, think about it. No more. I don't have to worry about venture a highway. I mean, holy mackerel, I can't imagine. I would shoot myself rather than live in Los Angeles. If I had to get to anywhere, anytime, I, I don't know how many people die on the way trying to get a, a, an ambulance to wherever it needs to go, but it's got to be huge. There, the first thing I'd put in is, an, is a vertical takeoff ambulance um, uh, that could get people to wherever they need to be as soon as they can. But, you, but uh, Delta actually is... Um, is uh, moving ahead. They've got, um, they've got, uh, uh, depends on who you talk to. I like it. I look at it and it's a jobby, but it's a Joby or something. I don't know. Anyhow, those, they've given uh, Joby or Jobby um, a big contract. And what they want to do is they want to fly people from the airport to the city center. And they're going to start off in New York and Los Angeles. And then they got a long list of all their places. I think they're going to go to Atlanta. These are all places where there is no train, or if there is, it's like nasty and slow and with a hundred different stops. This will take you from the airport directly to, in, in the case of Detroit, right downtown Detroit, probably on the top of the Renaissance Center or something like that, where there's a, a helipad, anywhere there's a helipad. That, that kind of continuous back and forth and the, you know, especially if we can make it an EV, I, I think that's a, that's a brilliant way to get around having to build a train or having 10 zillion, you know, Ubers going back and forth. Th that's a much smarter idea. Yeah. And actually, we're working with a company um, in downtown Detroit uh, that um, uh, that's, uh, that's working on a, uh, if you like, uh, an Airbus, literally, uh, that, that could, could move people, eight or 10 people at a crack. But anyways, it, I, think, I think that's what we really need. And that's where I'd really like to move to. Um, I think that uh, the electric car business is dominated by Tesla. And uh, there are some that'll make it, like Ford and Rivian and, uh, and a few others. But, uh, but really and truly, what, what we need to do is move to move to the you know the third dimension we we've been uh, 2d for a long time and we should be we should be looking at 3d yeah yeah so there you go that's my and sandy i'm gonna build on that a little bit so joe joe sandy he sets the vision of the company and he's done that for 33 years that he's been at the helm at monroe and associates and what's really important is we need to attract and retain talent our product are people so we are a consulting firm. And I think the shift to EVs, we made the decision in a day, particularly when we got our Model Y, that we are now focused on EVs. And you mentioned earlier a mission. We, we want to make sure we have a positive impact on the environment, and we believe that there's a, lot, there's a lot of ways to get there. So we will still help other industries if it will improve uh, the economic impact. So if we worked in the oil and gas industry, we'll still help them out. So we're not, uh, you know, bound by, you know, some strict uh, ethos. But Sandy sets the vision and going after VTOLs, going after the, the EV space and pushing our message out on our Monroe Live YouTube channel, it allows us to attract talent and we have to attract and retain and develop talent. And you know, on the day-to-day -day aspects of Monroe and Associates, it's really important to have a leader like Sandy who's out there in the, uh, in the news and being interviewed and, and um, you know, sitting down with Elon Musk. So I think that's really important for us to thrive as a company is attracting, retaining, and developing talent. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, just the other thing that people don't uh, like to say too often, but even when, um, even when we, uh, you know, transfer this knowledge, uh, like we're going to be talking to some folks, I think, soon in Saudi Arabia. They want to they, they wanna get out of the rut of, of pumping oil and whatnot. So we're going to go and train them in the systems that we use. We don't make a hell of a lot of money, but what it does is transfer the knowledge to another generation or a different part of the world. And, and I think that that's something else. After a while, you know, you make a few bucks and okay, so now all of a sudden money is not the big driver in your life. 
Um, I think that everybody should try and figure out sometime in their life when it's time to, you know, give back. And that's why I'm very interested in, um, in transferring this knowledge that we've got. That's why I wanted you to, to maybe contact the guys at NASA, and if I can help there, I definitely will do it. So these are, these are interesting times that we're living in. I wish, this is the only time in my life I wished I was younger. I'd love to be hanging around for an extra 10 years because quite frankly, I think that the next 10 years will have about the same amount of mm, drama or whatever as, uh, as, well, my grandfather. My grandfather joined the British Navy when he was nine or 10 or something like that as a boy sailor. He was on a, he was on a ship, uh, like a sail ship that also had steam, okay? So he went from the age of sail all the way through to the space age. Wow, are you kidding me? Think on it, that's really ponderous. People were still, this was a, some sort of a, a battleship or something that still had sail and steam, and he watched the first man land on the moon. Can you imagine that? All the change and whatnot that happened in, in, that, in that time frame? I think the next 10 years are going to be even more dramatic than that, especially being as space now isn't a government problem or a government, uh, I don't want to say bloodsucker, but, but I can't think of anything else. Right now, you've got people who are, who are taking, the, um, taking the, the, the reins of this gigantic new uh, technology and, and basically commercializing it, turning it into something where it, it turns a buck and, um, man, it moves faster. Yeah. Well, well, Sandy, you touch on something really important to me that might be interesting to the people watching this. And then if I hope I remember, I've got three questions that I'd like to actually field to both of you. But I'll, hey, I'll man, we're interviewing you. <laughs> oh, OK, go ahead. What is <laughs> it? <laughs> <laughs> and that is um, uh, my uh, my wife's grandparents are both saying we're we're they're lovely people. They were farmers. Um, they're, they're both saying we're, we're done. We've seen our grandkids whenever it's time for us to, to go to heaven, we'll go to heaven. And, um, my, uh, my stepdad, my second dad, my mom remarried, he yeah. was a, a consultant on, uh, machining operations and efficiency of machining operations for like the Humvee ball joints and howitzer cannons and, and that type of thing. Metallurgy, mm. um, yeah. metallurgy, particularly moving uh, joints, metallurgy consulting and production consulting um, and did that all around the world. And now he just turned 80 and he's he still likes to work and is still super knowledgeable, but is having trouble plugging in. I see an opportunity where some people, either because they think they're too young or they think they're too old, have disengaged and don't have a passionate reason to be around, or the reverse, people who have high skill and they know it and haven't figured out how to plug in. And th this is something that I, I've taken from working for Elon that way of working is not for everybody. So what is a highly innovative way to work that's for an even wider group of people? Not everyone has energy 12 hours a day, right? So what are the, what's working? Clearly it's working. What's working about the 12 hour shifts? And is there a way that you could access people that have two awesome hours of energy a day? And that's what they've got right now. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's age related or health related or, or just they have other interests, right? How do you harness that and get some of the same capability? That's the reaction I have to part of what I heard you said when you said, I'd like to be around another 10. I was like, yes, people who are running a business, growing a business and want it to continue a long time and they're not 22 years old. I'm excited to hear that. I like when 22 people, 22 year old people are too. I like it, everybody. And I think there's an opportunity there and a massive amount of talent, capability, and firepower that is underutilized or non-utilized or even avoided. So a thing. Then three questions. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. Let's make sure we collaborate on this. But I, I, I'm, I also have three burning questions. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I found that the more you work, the more you can work. The more you, you know, the, the alarm clock rings and you get up and you go and then, like for instance, uh, I probably won't get out of here till six tonight and I got in at uh, 7.30, so, or thereabouts. So um, um, that's a long day, you know, um, old guys are supposed to sit at home, eat potato chips and watch TV. That, that doesn't really appeal to me a whole lot. Um, but I think that the, the idea of retiring means you now can go into the slow death mode. And Dr. Deming was a friend of mine. And, um, and he said, retire and die. And that's kind of like, uh, he never retired. He was 93, I think, or something like around there when he, we had, we had dinner, uh, myself and a few other guys. And we had dinner and, and he was as vibrant as anything. A month later, I don't know what killed him, but he, he, I wasn't in the country at the time and he died. I want to go out like that. I don't, I don't want to be sitting uh, in front of a box watching some goofy daytime uh, women yelling at each other or something. I don't know. I don't watch much TV. I don't have, actually, I don't have, I don't have cable. I don't watch TV. So I think that what you really need to do is, if, and by the way, there's two, there's two groups that are underutilized. One is the old folks, um, people like my age and even older. These, these people have lots of things that they can bring to the party. They, 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 know, um, they know stuff, but they're not, they're not sharing it because most people will look at them and say, oh, not the old geezer talking again. Believe me, um, all you have to do now is try and find a World War II vet that wants to tell any story. Boom, people are very interested. But what happened when... I mean, when I was a kid, when I was a toolmaker or apprentice, everybody had been in the war. Everybody had stories. Nobody wrote anything down. And uh, the last thing in the world that any, any kid uh, who had a parent like that, anything, the last thing in the world they wanted to hear was what happened during the war. The same thing is true now. What happened to get us to where we got to? Who, who is that guy that, that had the uh, tinfoil shoebox that, that could fly around. What happened to that data? That's the one. And then the second one is kids. Holy mackerel. I, I've got one story that uh, I really and truly, one of these days will video. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a kid that, um, that came up to me and obviously he's a whole lot smarter than I was. He was maybe, I don't know, eight, nine, maybe even younger. And, uh, you know, Good at Do I have the pleasure of meeting Mr. Sandy Monroe? And I'm loading two by fours into into the back of my my pickup truck. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. This kid. Anyways, one of these days we'll we'll do that. And the kid is truly in, interested, and they have great ideas. Kids have fabulous ideas. If you want to know what the future is, don't talk to the 35 to 55 year olds. They'll just tell you what you want to hear. Go and talk to the kid. Oh, I don't like the smell of gasoline. Oh, my father is, um, is, a, is a, a tremendous disappointment because he hasn't jumped onto the EV wagon. How long does it take to convince? Oh, my God. I, and we've, we've, Corey and I, when we made our cross-country trip, we got stopped by kids with, with a, a point of view, with ideas. Those are the two, the very young and the very old. That's where we, we miss the boat a lot. And, um, and you don't find the very old saying things like, well, I'm going to do a quiet quit. And you don't have, and kids don't even understand that concept. They don't understand the concept of how hard it is to have a 12 hour day. If they could, they'd stay up 16 hours a day, maybe, uh, maybe to get the job done. So the more you want to relax, the less likelihood you're, you're going to get people to, to, to like the 12 hour day. Anyway, what are the three questions before we... Where I, I rattle on forever. I'm all in with everything I just heard. Corey, anything you want to add to that topic before I try to take yeah. us in a different direction? 
A few things. You know, I hired on at Monroe and Associates 17 and a half years ago, and I was 18 years old. The next youngest person was 41, but the average age was like 55. <laughs> so I've seen a massive change in age. So I was able to soak up all this information from people like Ivan Chambers and Bob Meese, who are no longer with the company. And now we have a nice core of millennials and we have co-ops, our, our age is shifting down. And there's a few people who are still with Monroe and Associates that are brilliant. And they can sometimes be off-putting to the younger crowd because they know everything. I'm not gonna name names, but there's three, probably three people in our organization that can be overbearing. I mean, absolutely overbearing in their different ways. And many people didn't like working with these three people and I've gone, on, I've gone on work trips to California with one of them. And people are like, how can you stand being with that person for a week and a half in California? I'm like, do you not realize how much I learn from them? And, and reframing your mind, I think, is very important. Because I reframe my mind whenever I'm around person A, B, or C. And, and they're approaching retirement age or even older. I, I think I'll name Marty. Marty's like 85. He's really smart. But the other two are still with the company in some capacity. I just find it phen a phenomenal opportunity to learn. So I try and tra train our middle people, the 35 to 50, that you have to, you have to really re reframe your mind because there's so much to be learned. I want to hear the stories. I want to get the context from them. Yeah. Brilliant, Corey. Thank you, Sandy. There's a, a tactic I learned from someone named Paul Moore. It predates Paul by quite a ways, but I want to credit by name the person who shared it with me, Paul Moore. Um, last I saw, he was with a company called Rocket Nine out of Silicon Valley area, greater Silicon Valley area. Uh, it's a group development style that let me put a name on what I experienced in Tesla and then when I visited SpaceX. It's called Mob or Mob Development. And some people react negatively mm. to the name mob. You know, it's an unruly group. Uh, well, part of it is the name's got to be funny enough to remember and mm. to, to stick in your mind. So I actually think it's a perfect name. But other people have come up with less contentious names like ensemble development, which is actually really fitting. I, I do like ensemble or just group work. Um, but mob has a specific format and set of roles that make it a game. You learn the roles, you and, and they're easy to learn. They have like a one sentence to two sentence description each, and then a few guidelines if you're interested to read deeper. But they're they're well positioned to complement each other. You play a role, one of the roles, there's a list of them, and you have a timer before you rotate roles. And that's how everything got done. I, principle one that I just learned from, from you, Sandy, uh, do the work as a group if you want it to be good work. Yeah. I, I think mob formalizes that, gamifies it. There's a podcast just about it called Mob Mentality, and it's fantastic. Uh, Chris mm. Lucian, Austin Chadwick are regulars. They, they put it together mostly, but other people are involved too. Um, that format with intentionally people from radically different perspectives, capabilities, ages, mm. I think is a recipe superpower. And I'd like to see that be what people think school is. I'd like people to have that be what people think an internship is. And in Tesla and SpaceX, I'll assert that I think that's what work is. So let's do that a lot more um, with people of all ages. Because it's not one person talking and one person doing all day. You have to rotate every three to seven minutes. So you see that person work, but everyone is fresh all the time. So it's more a set of sprinters instead of marathoners because not everyone's built like a marathoner. Um, and almost anyone can at least walk for seven minutes, right? So you're, you do whatever it is for three to seven minutes and rotate. And it's a group of three to five people. So you're always fresh and you have time to think about the greater perspective because two people are really active and the other two to three are researching or complementing or holding the fixture that you're welding or, or whatever, or even just having a coffee, but they have to be present. You're in the game because they're up soon. Mm -hmm. I think this is an action an actionable manifestation of what uh, Corey, you just talked about to take advantage of the experience that you, that you got from the greater team. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
so hashtag mob development, one word will get you a lot. There, there's yeah. a book on it uh, by Woody Zool that's that's fun. Some people like books, some people prefer podcasts. Um, I do it in all the consulting I do. If anyone ever takes one of my online courses or consults with me, I always mob with everyone. And, and, and it's often pointed out as this is the culture we need. And I, I think that's probably true. Before I miss the opportunity, then I do yeah. have three questions. <clears throat> yeah. Let's see if I can keep all three in my mind. One, now um, the I, parts of lean are very popular globally. Uh, parts of reduce uh, complexity and cost without frustrating your customer. Use less stuff without frustrating your customer is yeah. at some level globally understood, even if not everyone is doing it so well all the time. What is this this agile piece is reduce the cost to make change cost in time money frustration basically it's more fun and not painful in time or cost to make change so we can introduce change all the time right let's ramp up the rate of change and then musk phrases it pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run mm -hmm. well what i'd love to see uh so there's an implied ask in here what i'd love to see is a group a lot like Monroe and Associates, maybe it is Monroe and Associates, that when they do a teardown and analyze a production build, they also put a number on cost to change. With we this do design, that. Yeah. With, with this design, if we were going to switch this thing from battery cell tech to solid state battery tech, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the future, but for example, if there's going to be a step change, what would the cost be on a scale of one to 10 or, or a dollar or Euro or yen or RMB to, to make that, to execute that change. And so you get an agile factor. And that I think is where people would get way more shocked about the products, all the must companies put out. Yeah. Like if yeah. someone tore down a Neuralink um, and compared that to any embeddable electronic device, they would say, on the, the cost to make change scale, I've never seen anything like this. It would just be a completely different optimization. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be really keen in that becoming a better understood benchmark. Uh, right now, when I propose these types of numbers, many people say that's the only place they're getting that information. Um, I'd, I'd like that to be much better mm -hmm. understood. Okay, so here's something that um, I did. I did it at Ford. Um, after I moved out of engineering, um, they sent me to finance staff. And what I did was um, I did a, a, an analysis, white paper, or whatever, and it was the cost of not changing. The cost of not changing. So what I did was I took an example. It was somebody wanted a machine <clears throat> it's going to cost $250,000. And for that kind of money, it had to go to a VP. So I knew that this had to be done quickly. And what I did was I, I, I kept following it up. And I watched it go through everything that I had control over. Um, that would be up to a grade 11 or whatever the heck I was at the time. And then, and then after that, um, it went into Never Never Land. And I waited and I waited and I waited and I was supposed to get this thing first before and then I would, I would, you know, notify the guys in the plant, get it rolling. So we knew how much it, the machine cost. We knew how much of an impact it would have on the, um, on the assembly line. All this stuff was all known, right? The return on investment was there. So now I'm tracking how much did it cost to get from the time that the guy wrote that contract or that uh, purchase order to the time when it got so signed by the VP and the time that the purchase order could be released. That waste of time, okay, was what I was looking for. So I knew that it got up to at least a management level or director level, and then it kind of like vanished and I didn't know what happened. I went and chased it down. After I waited a month and a half or two months, I, I couldn't wait anymore. I went it 
And so I went up the, the chain. And so you have the finance guy who's the vice president and you got somebody in manufacturing that's a vice president, somebody in purchasing and whatever. All these people had to sign it. And I went and found the thing. I, I can't remember which vice president had it sitting in a box and it, it never got signed. Ah, oh, yeah, that crap comes across my desk all the time. I'm a busy man. Pass the coffee. That, that little doodad right there, I found out it cost us about one and a half million dollars. One and a half million dollars because it sat in an outbox or an inbox and never got signed. Holy, do that is when we started figuring out what's the cost of dwell or if you want to call it wasted time or dwell time, what's the cost to the company? And we did this graph up and I did a whole bunch of calculations. And when I made a presentation <coughs> about that to, uh, to the finance people, the VP of finance, and, and he looked at it and he said, I can't believe this. And I said, here's, here's the facts. I mean, this is how much extra labor was needed. This is how much uh, downtime there was. This is how much this. this uh, I said, it's all here. None of he said, no, I, I, can't, I can't believe that, that, that it takes so long. I thought he was questioning my numbers. He, he had no clue. I did a, a lot of studies after that to find out how come people go out of business. And usually it's because they don't move fast enough. When, it, when it's simple, all you got to do is sign a damn paper. And why do I have to have a vice president when the machines are down? We're losing money. Why are, we, why are we wasting time and money on that? So anyways, what wound up happening was I got a, <clears throat> I got a giant budget. And so I would approve stuff. I'd give, I'd give them the money right away so they could get it done. And then the consequences, if I made a mistake, would come later on. But yeah, I, we, do, we do have that kind of data. People don't believe it. But I really like the, the Elon. We, we've told, uh, we've used this phrase a lot. Elon or Tesla moves at the speed of thought. That's what we think. One day somebody thinks of it, next day somebody tested it, and the third day it's being built. And that's what we like the best. Elon and his, and his Tesla team do it like remarkably well. So. I was in Tesla while the <clears throat> giga casting model Ys were, were being introduced. And every 45 minutes all day, a new giga casting came across one of the production lines 45 minutes that that's the speed at which different castings were being tried and i uh, i was staying in an extended stay hotel um which was already a weird experience anyway during covid right i, I mean truly this was early in covid where people really weren't sure what was what and a lot of people were still wearing plastic suits like in a surgery i mean it, it was an intriguing time to be an extended stay hotel in a physical manufacturing environment and in Fremont, California. Um, but I, I, there's an outdoor area and on that date it was open. I mean, you didn't know what was going to be open when what's allowed to be open and under what terms, but there was an outdoor barbecue area and it was open. And after work, like 8 PM, I was grilling steaks and having a beer and there were a group of other people wearing, Tesla t-shirts. And I walked over and introduced myself. Hi, I'm Joe Justice. I'm a, I'm a Tesla employee. I see you're wearing shirts. Um, and it looked like they were wearing work shoes. I, I say, are you employees too? They said, no, no, we're, we're a contractor. They were all from the same contractor. It turns out they were from the same area around Notre Dame where I grew up in Indiana. So it was easy to talk. They were from a tool and die maker and they, they, said come to our area we'll, we'll we'll show you so i i came in early the next morning like 3 a.m to uh explore their work area it was a group of people sitting on the concrete floor with laptops and they were drawing new tools new dies uh for giga casting for the model y they're, they're drawing them and as they're drawing it the one they just finished drawing is being machined yeah uh, and they'd recycle previous dyes, you know, make, make right. Yeah. You burn it, existing yeah. dyes or they'd make whole new <laughs> segments if they needed to. And then those would go directly into the giga cast. And every 45 minutes, there was a new tool and die rammed into the giga cast. And that's just how they worked all day. 
And then there was another shift. So 24 hours a day, every 45 minutes tried. And these were not test parts. These went through, the, the reason I saw it is I was in a different area in production and they were coming through every 45 minutes, a different batch. I've never seen that rate of change. To my knowledge, yeah. every single one of those was sold, all those different versions. And so the, the tracking is interesting. The fact that it's a vendor is interesting. Um, the road legal certification is intriguing. Luckily, that matched my background and part of why I was doing the role I was. I was in fast road legal certifications, legal and ethical yeah, was yeah. a specialty of mine. Um, but I, I think if people want to understand what agile is, it's having that be not abnormal, having it be normal to introduce new parts, even large metal parts, embed electronics, involving suppliers on 45 minute rhythm. <laughs> like that's a two and a half yeah. to seven year project in normal companies. Or never. I mean, if it wouldn't have been for Elon Musk uh, sh uh, showing up with the uh, castings, no one would have ever done it. Uh, uh, we've had we've had a, a cast rolling chassis um, 15 years, 12, 15 years. I don't know, a long time. Nobody would go for it, it because they always go back to the 1950s when somebody did a study and the study was conclusive that the right way to build a car is using a unibody and or in Europe they call it a monocoque at the end of the day <clears throat> maybe it was good then but it ain't good now and it hasn't been good for a long time but they still go back to it well look at this study that was done in 1957 how many of you here were born in 57 well I, I, we can't we can't refute it it came from some big consulting house. Okay, good, man, must be right. I mean, really and truly, um, people are, a lot of, especially <clears throat> engineers, would much rather say, oh, I got the book, I, I read the book, and, and the book said this, and that's what I did, I'm done. I mean, it's just another, another day at the beach. And that's where, if you aren't thinking agile, you're you're probably going to, uh, somebody's going to come along and back you with a shovel uh, to um, throw dirt in your face uh, because you're going to die. Yeah. Anyways, you got two more questions. Let's see if I got them. That, that, that last roundabout was so good that I might have, that I might have lost them. Um, I, I think they were about um, what does Monroe Associates need, want, or interested about what I know about? Um, which I think is agile. And then what is it that I think I know about, which I think is agile, that I need to learn from Monroe Associates. So the, the rule card you held up, what should we do to see if any of it, if at all, needs to be updated with what I think I know about agile? And then what about how I'm teaching agile needs to be updated with uh, what Monroe and Associates knows? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's pretty keen. And then uh, if you're getting into VTOLs, then um, th there's some in intriguing opportunities there too. Yeah, well, actually, um, in the interest of time and, and quality of conversation, I'd rather uh, take that question um, and, um, and turn it into like maybe some kind of a Zoom call where we've got one or two hours just to discuss that. Because I'd like to... I'd like to know more. I have your, um, I have a um, uh, document here that's in front of me that I was, uh, I was reading and stuff, and I'm really intrigued with, um, because a lot of what we both talk about is the is the same sort of stuff. We call it different names, but but this is for me. Almost all this stuff came from came from Dr. Deming or or from Toyota when it was the old Toyota, not the new Toyota. The new Toyota has unfortunately been Americanized. And, and I think that there's a lot of common ground that we could, uh, we could probably uh, cover. But even more than that, I think one company could learn from the other or we could share ideas or something. I have no real, mm, I, I, I know a lot of people, you know, they, they drive nails into their product or they, copyright it and then they're serious about it <clears throat> suing and things i've always found the only guys that make any money on that are the lawyers and 
and you never make any friends. So I think we should take that offline and, and really, really see what we can do about drilling down to find out how we can both improve. And, and when we do that, our, our customers or the people that we work with, they're going to, they're going to improve. And, and that, that's really the, uh, the real meaning of life or whatever. That's what we're supposed to do here is to improve the quality of life to everybody that comes after us. So, so um, here in, in Japan, teardowns are um, not something people aren't aware of them. Now, the, the automotive tuner market is its own unique beast in Japan. And in a way, it's massive. Mm -hmm. You know the the um, specialty yeah. tuning. They're they're almost like OEMs, right? Some of these tuning right. companies you buy their car, right? Um, so modifying a car is the thing, but tearing down a car is not well understood or known. Uh, so what my company has done here in Japan is we've ordered a Roadster, a Tesla Roadster, uh, the the new one. Yeah. And who knows when it'll be released in Japan? I assume there'll be a significant lag after it's released. And, and, and the rationale behind it is something I've had a chance to talk about in other YouTubes, why Tesla does a ripple release around their right. production centers. So in the event of a recall, because it's a new product by definition, it's not as far, right? So they start yeah. with their manufacturing hubs. And Japan's not very near any of the current manufacturing hubs. It's not even that close to Shanghai. So um, I assume it'll come here after it's had a chance to be analyzed already around California. And But at some point, it'll arrive here. And our intention is to do a teardown to show the modules, to show the reusable mm -hmm. parts. Yeah, yeah. Say, this is why the cost to manufacture this supercar, this fastest car in the world that can fly, is... I mean, that breaks the idea of what a hypercar is. I mean, breaks it, like makes fun of the idea of what a hypercar yeah. is, is how in, yeah. insanely capable the Roadster is intended to be. Um, how to do that at the price to manufacture that's like a Camry? How to do that? And, and so cutting it apart and showing that in Japan uh, is something I'm keenly interested in doing. I, I'd like to do that all around the world, but we ordered one in Japan because that's novel here, uh, completely novel here. And I would like to invite Monroe and Associates to be involved in any way Monroe and Associates is interested, whether you're mentoring my agile group, tearing this car down, or whether you're doing it and we're watching, or whether you're refereeing as if it's a boxing match. Well, a, a bunch of uh, us uneducated in teardowns have our mind blown. Maybe we're doing it wrong, but we're really excited. And that's still part of the part of the good of it. Um, whatever, whatever it is. Or even if you just analyze our YouTubes afterwards and say they should have done this. I think even the rolling com commentary would still be fantastic. But um, mm. to whatever level that's intriguing to any members of the staff, everyone or or just 10 people or, or whatever. Um, I'd like to be your host for wh whenever it's released, whenever it arrives and we cut it apart. Well, actually <clears throat> we, we have a list of, I don't know, 40 different cars that are coming out next year. And, um, and we're going to put, uh, Corey wants to put the top five um, out there, the five we think, and then people will vote on them. And that's how we're going to probably uh, get. And I know that the Roadster is on that list. So, um, and it's one of my top five as well. So maybe there's some kind of a collaboration there because these things are not cheap. And um, and tearing it apart, you only get one kick at that cat. So again, this sounds like another one of these things. Eric is less is getting longer and longer. He's going to. But anyways, we we definitely need to uh, to to talk about that because. Like I say, um, when we do it, we tear them apart, we do the material science, we do the costing, we do everything. So there might be, uh, you know, there's, there's collaboration here at, at three, at least three different levels. So I think this could be great. Yeah. Well, the Teardown Titans, I, I certainly yeah. benefit from them on, I mean, I've taken cars apart before, but not at the level of analysis that that Monroe and Associates does. So being mentored by the Teardown Titans, going to Teardown Titan School would be would be awesome. Yeah. And of uh, course, we provide the translation to make the assets available in both languages, potentially yeah. three. 
might post those in German as well to create more of a global footprint for the activity. Absolutely. We, this, is, this is simple stuff. We can, we can make this all happen um, and everybody wins. So that's kind of, that, that I'm, I'm, in, I'm in all day long. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's uh, close this down a bit. And so uh, let me thank you, Joe, for a wonderful, absolutely brilliant um, uh, hour and a half. I'm, I'm really, really happy. It went really, really fast. Um, I, I can't speak for Corey, but I know that I'm, I'm extremely excited about everything we talked about. Uh, I, everything went in a good direction. This has been a really cool hour and a half. It really has. Yeah, Joe, thank you for your tremendous insight. It really was really valuable for us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. The, the honor is mine. The honor is mine. A anyone who goes to Tear Down Titan School is a changed person <laughs> afterwards. I'm just starting yeah. my job. <laughs> okay, Thanks, good. Corey. All righty. And thank you out there uh, for watching Monroe Live. Um, please stay tuned and, uh, and there'll be more, I'm sure, coming up. Maybe we'll be, uh, we'll be having uh, Joe here to help us tear down that Titan. Or sorry, that, uh, that tear down that Titan, tear, tear down that roaster. And um, yeah, so stay tuned. Thank you. Bye-bye.